series. So I'm very happy to give this uh, series. Thanks, Thierry. And uh, so the, the idea here is to come to recent results, which uh, are not yet published, but are online, which deal with the, the dynamics of optimization, optimization really for serious high dimensional statistics or machine learning tasks. Okay, so the, the, before I uh, write anything, the, there are plenty of uh, natural methods to optimize. So all these questions of high dimensional statistics end up being a question of optimization. Practically, that's how it works. So you have to, the, the task is optimized. I'll, I'll come back to everything, don't worry, don't worry. We have four lectures for that. So the task is in the end to optimize, to minimize, let's say, a function of very many variables because we are in high dimension. Okay, so you have a function of very many variables, which on top of that is random. The randomness here comes from the data. Okay, so I'll explain all that. So that's the task. And uh, how you build this function, what you do with it, what type of optimization you do, we'll come back to. But you can imagine, of course, that a minimizing a function of very many variables, which is random, could be complicated. Right? Nevertheless, so if you do physics, for instance, you're used to do statistical physics, you're used to that. The function you want to optimize is, of course, your Hamiltonian. It could be random if you do physics of disordered systems. And then the dynamics are very interesting, complicated. And everybody knows that the important, at, at least at low temperature, the, the, the natural time scales are very long, typically exponential in the dimension. Right? And that's okay for physics, because that's what happens and you see your system aging, doing all sorts of crazy things. The important thing is that, of course, in optimization, if, if, you're, if you're employed by one of the big companies doing machine learning, and if you tell them that your algorithm will take exponential time in the dimension, the dimension is 10 to the 9, so your algorithm will take the 10 to the 10 to the 9 steps, you'll be fired. Right? So these things work in much, much shorter timescales. So here the question that we're after is, how is that possible? Why is it that is functions that are usually typically non-convex, complicated, topologically complicated, why is it that you can find something which is decently close to the minimum in short-ish times? Right? That's, that's the mystery I'm after. All right? Let me give you the answer so that you can leave the class after 10 minutes. The, Typically, of course, so analyzing dynamical systems optimization in very high dimensions seems crazy. Typically, what happens, of course, is that you have a finite dimensional projection of the system which becomes autonomous. Essentially, you don't need to follow the 10 to the 9 parameters, but only 17. This is what we call summary statistics and the projection called effective dynamics. When this works, of course, usually when you have a dynamical system, if you project it, you don't get an autonomous dynamical system. But in this case, this kind of works. And the question is, of course, what makes the fact that you, this works in short time is the fact that you have strong enough signal. Right? That is, this is what, you, what we have to quantify. But the, um, the question, the more important question is, how do you know how to, what to follow? What are those summary statistics, those relevant objects? In some academic examples, you have a guess, and I will show you examples of that type, right? And then you can follow. But the last step of our common work, and by the way, this common work is with um, the one, the, the work I want to finally explain, and maybe the last is common work with Okor Jagannath, uh, Reza Geisari, and for the last paper, uh, Zhao Yong Hong. So, the, um, in the end, if you ask yourself, how do we find those important directions? Right? Then, the system does it on its own. 
of course. But it doesn't tell you. These are the important 17 variables out of a billion variables. But how do, what are those, out, uh, those uh, autonomous direction, the thing that this dynamical system that you have to follow, it comes spectrally. Right? If you've done any statistics, you know that in the end everything is spectral. So it comes spectrally and it will be, and I will explain that, this is why this, is why this class is called random matrices and something. So it will come from a dynamical, a, a phase transition in random matrix, which is well known, which is called the BBP transition, which I will explain, right? And this spectral transition will, is crucial and gives you the, uh, this specific projected dynamics, which can be very complicated and interesting. And I will illustrate that then in a more and more sophisticated and heavy example coming from serious machine learning tasks. Okay, so this is the, the plan. I will start today by telling you very briefly what, a little more, just what I said, but with a little more context. And then I will go to the random matrix side very quickly, explain this BBP transition. So we have this in our pocket and then we can, we can go back to the optimization thing. Okay, so. So we're going to do statistics. So statistics, you have different uh, type of task, I mean, type of things to do. Of course, I'm sure, I'm sure I, you've all taken a class in statistics, I hope so. At some point you do estimation, testing, and today maybe an, um, one of the most important tasks of, uh, that you can do with machine learning is also sampling, right? So estimating, you all know what that is. You have, you want to estimate a parameter, Testing, you want to test if an assumption and hypothesis is true, and sampling, you want to generate exam, you, you want to generate a, a sample from a, a complicated distribution. Okay, so let's let's stay for the moment with estimation, the basic task, and let me even may, do the, the simplest thing of all, which is parametric estimation. So what does that mean? You have a sequence of uh, you have a family of of probability distribution. Right? Parameterized by a theta. And let me take the simplest. Con so these are, let's say, probability distributions on uh, Rn, let's say. And theta is, let's say, a subset of Rd. Rp, let's say, but rather. Okay, and you have, uh, let's say the simplest thing is you have a theta star, which is the true value of the parameter in the system you're observ observing. But of course you don't know what theta star is. Instead of having theta star, you're given a sample, so that's statistics 101, x1, xm of IID random variable with distribution theta star. Okay, so you don't know theta star, you want to estimate theta star. You have access to a sample and you try to get theta star. So that's the task, right? So in statistics, you always have a task and data. That's what you really have. So you have this data. These are vectors in RM. And then you want, the task is find theta star, or find a close approximation of theta star. That's it. And then now you may have a million different ways to do that. That's the class in statistics. But what is specific about what we're trying to do here? We are here in the context where n very large. Okay, n goes to infinity for us n is 10 to the 9, all right? p may be very large too. The usual context you've taught or you learn in statistics is of course the opposite. You have n and p are fixed and this m is very large. All the theorems of probability are about law of large number or m large. 
Okay, so of course this works here too. If m is super large compared to n, then, then the usual, you, you must expect that there is a regime where the usual results of statistics will apply. Okay, but that's typically not what's going on. In machine learning, the problem is not that we have too much data, is we don't have enough. Right? Usually the m is too small. Okay? Big data means n is large. Okay? And possibly p. So that's the context, abstractly. So that's, that's what you want to do, and now how do you do it? So first, so then you have to define a statistical procedure. Before, so let, let me remind you something. There are in fact three steps. I'm very vague here, but it's important to remember. In all these things, you have three levels here. The first one is information theory. The second one is Then the, then the second one is the statistical procedure. And the third one is the algorithmic aspect. And they come in that order. Okay, so the first one is, it could be when n is very large, it could be that the distance between p theta, the thing, the p theta star, the, the, the distribution given by the true value, and something without a signal, or let's say a theta prime, goes to zero with the dimension. Right? So if the total variation distance between p theta and p theta prime vanishes, then it tells you that there is no way you can statistically do something. When you take whatever function of this, it will simply not make a difference. So, so typically in very high dimensional things, and I will give you examples, there is typically an IT threshold that I will try to explain. So below this IT threshold, even if you're the god of statistics, you can't do anything. Okay? Then when you're above the IT threshold, then the fact that you're above the IT threshold says there is a possible observable function of your sample, the data you have, which will allow you to say something significant about the unknown distribution. Okay? What is that? So that the statistical procedure you choose. And this is up to you. So if you are a typical statistician of uh, you know beginning of the 20th century, you will do maximum likelihood, for instance. That's you know the recipe for the poor. You don't know what to do. You try that. Maybe uh, some kind of uh, uh, least square thing, even less. Right? But then you can do better things. This is open. You choose the procedure. Right? So in particular, here you could do machine learning. Right? Machine learning is just choosing. An R, so I will tell you what that is. A neural net is just choosing, and of course picking the neural net, picking the architecture, is precisely choosing a statistical procedure. Nothing tells you that all these statistical procedures work with the same amount of data. Right? So maybe some are better than others. All right? So once you've picked a statistical procedure, typically you end up in what I want to talk about, which are the algorithmic aspect. Usually it's optimization. Because this tells you, for a statistic maximum likelihood, tells you you build the likelihood function, you write usually the log of the likelihood, and you want to maximize it. How do you maximize it? So results in statistics tell you, if you're the god of optimization, then the result of this optimization will be good in that or that regime. But then there is a question of, can you find this? Can you solve this optimization problem decently? Okay? And then again, the question here is, as I mentioned, it's not an abstract question like, or a question in the, in the physics sense of it. Right? Here, if your n is large, you don't want the time of this optimization to be long. So you want optimization in short-ish times. Right? 
You, you don't want to go, because it's very natural to see optimization things that would last an exponential time in the dimension. So you don't want that. So the question here is, is optimization feasible in a decent time, right? And of course, optimization, you do it as you want. Right? That's now a, a completely different field. Okay, so let me, so we will concentrate on this type of thing, right? So what does that mean? It means you have, in fact, constructed already. Uh, so what do you do typically, whether you do statistic, I mean, ordinary statistics, machine learning, whatever. In the end, what you do is construct um, a loss function. Let's, let's call it like this. L, so that's, that's what you do. You're the, that's where your expertise as a statistician is. You construct the loss function from your space of parameter times the space of data, let's say with values in R, L of, uh, what do I call, theta x, okay? So that's a real number. And you want typically to optimize the expected value of this, and you want to build this such that the, let's say the, I call it loss, so you want a minimum, so that the minimum is achieved typically uniquely at the theta star you want to find, okay? But of course you don't have access to the true, to the expectation of this thing. So typically you want to look at phi of theta, which will be the expectation of L of theta x, under p theta, and you want this, you want this, typically you want this to be minimum, uniquely, at the point you want to find, theta star. Okay. All that belongs to the expertise of the statistician in you. Right? You build such a function, and then of course, so that's the statistical procedure. You don't have access to this, because you cannot do this expectation, you don't know the true distribution. So what you have access to is the empirical loss, which is just this. I'm sorry, M here, that's important. Okay, that's the only thing you have access to because you have a sample. So this object, call it I don't know, LM star, LM hat of theta. The only thing you want maybe to do is find the minimum of this. The, play, the important thing is not to find the minimum value, is to find the place where it's minimum. So the, the task is minimize LM hat. So the Typically, of course, here, the skill of the statistician is to build such an L and to prove theorems to the effect that the, the minimum of this is achieved at theta star and let's say uniquely or very close to, not at exactly, but the place where this thing is minimum should be very close to theta star because that's how you will estimate your theta star. Your estimator will be The place, the argmin if it, of this thing. Okay, so this is the, this is step two, right? Step two here is finding building such an L, and we'll see many examples, right? Such that building such an L, such that this argmin is indeed close to what you want to estimate. I'm taking the simplest case of parametric estimation here. Okay? So that's for you to do. But that is for m large, right? I'm sorry? For m large. No. That's exactly the point. Here, m is not large. m will be large, but not very large, because n is super large. Okay? So we are not in the regime, the usual regime, where n is fixed and m is large, right? Or when m is a million and m is a trillion, trillion. We're not in that regime. M will not be very large, okay? 
we will not have, there will be a regime where everything behaves like that, but there are different regimes and these are the ones that are important for mach modern machine learning. Okay? So that's the statistical thing, but then now you understand what step three is. Imagine that you've built a system in which you know that this thing is a good estimator. Imagine you're there. The next question is how do you find it? Right? How do you find the minimum of a function when the function is in 10 to the 9 variables? Yes? Sorry. Silly question from <coughs> someone knowing nothing to statistics. So, so if I imagine your framework, for instance, for an LLM, I mean, you're searching for the, the right parameters for the, the probability distribution of the next one. I mean, the, the right, uh, you're searching for the right row uh, in, in, uh, in a system with a huge N. Yeah. Then these I'm, I'm not, for the moment, I'm not doing things like sampling. I'm doing estimation. Right. So I'm doing a neural net, let's say, that's trying to classify images. OK, yeah, yeah maybe that's a simpler example. But then the L function is uh, something you bring? Or is of it course, of course. That's what I said. That's a statistical procedure. You're the genius in statistics, and you say, that's what you should do. You're Yann Lequin. You build the architecture. But I mean, the L is built so that uh, out of uh, specification, like I said, you want L measuring uh, yeah. the image to look it's, like it's it's For instance, it's the whatever distance between the output of your thing and, and the true thing, for instance. Okay. Yeah. For the moment, I stay abstract, but of I course, this will be. Uh, that's okay, a, that's I will give you very, soon, very simple examples. All right. So that's the statistical procedure step. Now you have the optimization. How do you optimize a function when theta is in super large dimension? And again, the question is, how do you optimize this in short time? Why does it work? Right? So now let me come back. I, on purpose, I did, uh, I'm here. Forget everything else. That's the type of function we have to optimize. It's a function of theta, which is in dimension 10 to the 9. And it's random, because the xi's are random. So what, should, what could? Let's come back to what I'm sure. So now we are in the optimization. So step three, that's what I want to talk about. The algorithm. So you, now we are into optimization. So you, what, what algorithm can you try? I'm sure you've done some, either taught or, you know. You can do gradient descent, I mean gradient flow. If you're a probabilist, you would do Langevin. You could do that. A little crazy, but you can do that. You can do gradient flow. You can do gradient descent. Right? You can do The, dis the difference for me between gradient flow and gradient descent is gradient flow is in continuous time, gradient descent is in discrete time. Okay, what else? Approximate message passing. Approximate message passing. Nobody does that, <laughs> except physicists <laughs> and me. But that's, a... that's why. Yeah. <laughs> SGD? Of course, SGD. Stochastic gradient descent. That's... So let me explain. Stochastic gradient descent is the only method that is used in machine learning. And, uh, and, uh, and I remember very well chatting with uh, people in this field and telling me, if you don't do that, it doesn't work. Okay? So we'll try to understand. Of course, SGD, I will explain what that is. There are a million variants of it. But we'll come back to that. Anyway, all that, let's take the simplest one to think. Let's take gradient flow. Right? So you just follow the gradient of this function. Let's, say, let's imagine that your function is smooth, very smooth, as a function of, uh, of theta. You follow the gradient. Okay? What could be the obstacles? Why would that not work it's performance? Why would such a thing not work in short time? Why is it that a gradient flow would not work? I'm sorry? This. OK? No. 
that's of course the important answer and the one that everybody everybody has it is important in this context but that's not the important thing so the first one is the topology right of the of the level lines of the loss function right if you have something that's, I draw the picture that you did with your hands if you have this if you go down here then you get stuck here and then in, the, in short time it will take a long long time to cross here so this is this is long right of course if you're in physics you don't care the system will do that will be metastable will wait a very long time and then cross the barrier and and end up there that's in fact what what's interesting in physics but here you don't want that so that's a, a, a first uh, obstruction that everybody thinks about which is because essentially when you're in finite dimension when n is fixed that's the only serious obstruction so optimization has has a huge field of work if you do it in in the convex setting when your l is strictly convex then there are a million different results but in the end the whole theory tells you it works right it works in rather short time Okay, so of course that's not convex, but that's not the point in high dimension. This can happen, but that's not the, only, the real problem, not the only problem. Okay. The, the real problem, that, the other problem that you have in very high dimension is entropy. Which you don't have in dimension three. Okay, so let me explain this. Imagine th this is the problem that every probabilist knows, which is called the needle in a haystack. So imagine that you, okay, let me do it very simply. Imagine that you are trying to explore you're trying let's say your state space is the, the discrete cube plus or minus one to the n okay you just have a sequence of n spins plus or minus one n large and you want to find the configuration one 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 all spins up but you have no clue right and you start at random that's the important thing. You have a non-informative start. You don't know where to look. So you start with a random configuration of plus or minus one. And now you try to find one. The one with all ones. First, you have no signal. You do it purely by a random walk. How much time does it take? You know, of course. <laughs> Exponential in n, obviously. So bad. All right, but that's a stupid search because you want everybody to be plus and you put no signal. So let's imagine now that you do something a little better. Now take a bias random walk on plus or minus one to the n. Right? So now you want everybody to be plus, so you bias in your random walk, you put a little bias towards plus. then this should work fast, right? Yes or no? Depends. It depends on the strength of your bias. Okay? So what's the problem here? So, another example. Biased Brownian motion on the sphere. Why do I take this example? It's essentially the same mathematically, but here the nice thing is I can draw a sphere. Well, you'll see this picture. So let's imagine that you want to find the North Pole. Here, of course, the sphere is in dimension n. This one is in dimension two. All right, and you you start at random, and you do a Brownian. If you do a Brownian motion, how much time does it take to come to a tiny neighborhood around the North Pole? Exponential in n. So very bad, bad algorithm. 
Now, take the function, which is, let's say, the distance to the North Pole, to the power, whatever. You take the gradient flow of that, maybe with a little Brownian motion if you want. And then, if, if you start here, how much time does it take? Very short. But if you start at random, it means that you start essentially at the equator, right? Because in high dimension, a point at random is at the equator of any point. And if you start at the equator, now it's hard to escape the equator. Why? Because the equator has a mass which is, I mean, I've already done this picture many times, this sphere, the way of seeing, looking at this sphere, is bad. The sphere in high dimension should look like this. These two things are the two hemispheres. Everything else is the equator. Because again, the, the, the hemisphere have a mass exponential minus constant n. And the equator is essentially everybody. So if you start at a point at random, you start in this random mess, and you have the problem of escaping the volume of the equator, the entropy. And it's not easy. Okay? So for that, you need a strong enough drift. We will see. Okay? So you have two different types of problem. Doing better than random, escaping entropy, and then maybe the topology of the level set. So maybe on top of that, your function here will be crazy. That's the difficulty. So will Will your signal be strong enough to help you escape entropy and not fall into the traps? Okay, so what is the signal strength here? Of course, it can be in your model, it can be strong. Well, we'll see, of course, that it also depends very much on the amount of data you have on M. So we have different regime depending on M and N, etc. Okay, so that's the two things. Now, what I was saying and what we are aiming at is that in the end, what we'll see that this question of very high volume and all that can, in, in some cases, be sidetracked. Side in fact, there are this, all these situations where only a finite dimensional projection is important. Typically, in this context, the only thing you really care about, if your goal is to find the North Pole, is the latitude. It's a one-dimensional object. Right? So in the end, maybe you can look just at the projection on the, on the on the latitude. Again, there is no real reason for this to be an autonomous system. If you have a differential equation in dimension a billion, there is no reason that any given projection is autonomous. Right? This will happen when we have this spectral transition, which I want to come to, okay? when the BBP transition happens. So I'm sorry, I, the BBP is for Bike Benarus Peche, so I will not say it completely, it's just a BBP. It's a very old thing, which is now 20 years old, essentially, or almost, and that I want to explain. All right, so before we get into all this story, let me come back, let me back up to the different tools that we'll need, which are in random matrices. Okay? Before I even go there, let me explain, for those of you who are, what is this function L? Okay, because that's what was asked here. So, examples of L, of course. Okay, you take the likelihood, typically the log likelihood, and the sum of log, which of course, gives you the likelihood. Right, the log of likelihood. I put a minus sign here because usually, of course, in statistics, you want to maximize the likelihood. Here, I want, I will want, I'll be like a physicist. I want to minimize everything. Okay, that's why you have a minus. So many, many more. But for instance, let let me build. Let me give you the. Oops, did I break something here? No. So let me give you the simplest examples of. Uh, of machine learning tasks. So, 
So what is the, 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 the fantastic thing about machine learning? It's just a specific, just that. That's all it is. But it's, it's incredibly uh, efficient, even though we don't really understand why. So the, the basic thing of machine learning is to, a, a choice of L in a specific functional class. That's what it is. So what is that? So let me explain. You build, so you've seen this picture a million times. Let me give you the simplest type of architecture, which is, of course, let's say, uh, feed-forward neural nets. So you have layers of nodes, etc. And so, and on these things, so these are nodes organized in layers, and you, you have a, a graph here which is directed for the moment. Okay, the simplest thing. So you have, and for the moment, let me take the simplest one, simplest possible architecture, which is uh, fully connected. Right, so fully connected means this, this is the first La layer, this is the second layer, etc. Last layer. And so here I have a fully connected graph. Every one of these guys is connected to every one of these guys. And it's, it works in etc. Okay? And same thing here, same thing here. Okay, so that's a very simple graph. Now, you simply do the following. You do the, the simplest... So on each of these edges, you put a weight. So if this is, let's say, node i and node j, here you put a certain weight, wij, which is a real number. Okay, so you have a, a graph, a weighted graph. And the only thing you do is the following. You take here a vector of this dimension, one, two, three, four, five, which is which would be your data. You pass it through this. So that's the word used in machine learning, which simply means you do the matrix multiplication. Right? You take this matrix here, and you multiply it by this vector. Right? So it's just a linear operation. And then when you come here, if I continued with, the whole thing would be linear, and nothing interesting would happen. But now what you do is that every one of these things, you have, you have what is called an activation function. Call it sigma. So it's a function of one variable. And every one of these numbers here, which you obtained by the linear multiplication before, you take sigma of it. Okay? So you have this very local operation here. And then again, you do multiplication by linear, by this layer, then you do the same activation function, etc. Okay? So Trivial thing. So the class, what, what we're saying here, that the class of function we have are compositions of linear and pointwise. Pointwise here means that the particular system of coordinates you've used is, is important. Okay. So what is the activation function? Typically, it could be uh, the, the, this type of function, Or it could be, the, well, the one that is really used is called ReLU, which is a crazy name in this community for a function we all know as under a different name, which is X plus. Okay, so ReLU means rectified linear unit. Okay, so which means, of course, we all know how to graph X plus, it's, it's, right? And you have a bunch of choices like that. The important thing is that they are nonlinear. Okay. Okay, so this gives you a class of function. Right? Then, then you have a loss in the end, a little L. So you take the output of this, right? So what is the parameter here? My set of parameters are all the W's. in all the layers. If I have R layers, it's all this collection. Okay? In fact, in practice, you have other things. Here I just put, uh, 
the linear thing. Typically, the, the activation also come with a threshold. That is, instead of being zero here, you could shift it. Right? So you also have the threshold. Let's forget that. So you see that if you have many, if the graph is large, then this parameter is high dimensional. Right? And so our n is, of course, the dimension of the data. In, in, here it's five, right? Our d, which is also very large, is the dimension of theta, okay? And m is the size of the sample. What do you do once you have, so you, you take your data, you pass it through this thing, you apply this, this architecture defines a, run, defines a function. I just defined it, right? Once you apply this function, let's call it f of theta, the function I just defined with a picture, Okay, of your f of theta and of your in, of your data. Okay, and then so this gives you a certain function, and you want it to be cl uh, close to the function you want to estimate. So then you just need in the end a loss function. Let's, you could take typically the L two loss function, something trivial, just to compare this function to what you want to to, to have. So whichever you want, it's not always the L2, or the L2 is the simplest one, but you know, so that's it. So in whatever topology you want to compare, you are in fact considering the best approximation to your unknown function by this, by a function in this class, right? So why would, so you had a question? Okay, so the, so why, so at this point it may sound a little strange. Not that strange, in fact. If you think of it, that's essentially the whole of analysis and approximation theories to do something like this. Except that instead of these crazy functions, what do we do as analysts? We take Fourier series. But that's the same thing, right? You have a class of function, which are Fourier series. Theta here is the set of all your amplitudes, variances, whatever, frequencies in your Fourier series. And we have abstract theorems saying a function can be, a, a reasonable function can be approximated well by its Fourier series, depending, on, and of course this is a long story. Okay? Uh, here, it's, it's saying, no, forget Fourier series. That's for analysts, it's not important. The, the, the cool class is this one. Okay? And what's amazing is that it, it does work. So the um, so first of course we, as mathematicians we need uh, something saying this is not totally crazy and for that we have there is a theorem which is called the universal representation theorem you can guess what it is if you remember Fourier series the universal representation theorem for Fourier series is to tell you that uh, any reasonable let's say L two function is a Fourier, the sum of a Fourier series. So here you have something similar, any reasonable function, whatever the dimension, in fact, is well approximable by this class. Okay? Now, why choose this one rather than the other one? So, of course, now a question of algorithm. But now the, so the, uh, what is the defect of the, of the thing I just said? Is every, every, beginner analyst knows that the theorem I just mentioned for Fourier series is not enough. What we keep doing is, given the function, how good is the error I make by taking the Fourier series up to that number of parameters, right? And then maybe the Fourier series is not good because it's uh, not localized, so maybe instead of Fourier series I should go to wavelets. Right? And then again, there are abstract results saying, if I take a, a function in this class, I can approximate it by wavelets expansion with that number of parameters and that quality of approximation. In this context, we don't have really that. This is kind of abstract nonsense universal representation theorem. Every time you hear universal, it means weak, right? So it's not quanti quantitative. And, and in particular, it could be that what it needs, it doesn't tell you what is the best possible architecture. So it could be that you need something super, uh, so by the way, I didn't say, if you have many layers in this direction, it's deep, that's depth, and this is width, 
Right? So typically, the universal approximation theorem I, I tell you is with one hidden layer, which means two layers, right? because that's the output layer. So one hidden layer is enough if you take it wide enough to essentially universally represent whatever reasonable function. Okay? It doesn't mean that it's algorithmically smart. Okay? What the big discovery of the last 30 years is that, okay, before I go further, who invented the one hidden layer neural net? Of course it's not the computer scientists, and of course it's not the mathematicians. Of course it is the physicists, always them. Of course. And that's the perception. That comes from statistical physics. That's the origin of all good ideas. And so you had this one layer thing, which performed fantastic task of classification. Then it got hit by a problem. I will mention it, what is called the XOR problem, that killed it because it didn't work. That was in the beginning of the 90s. Then came the, the, the first winter, as they call it, of artificial intelligence, because they didn't know what to do. And then suddenly somebody said, what if we put two layers? And that's the computer scientist. It's not the physicist. And then, uh, and then it worked well until they, they came to the second winter, which is the problem of this optimization. Right? That is, suddenly things didn't work that well to optimize. Right? So, so anyway, so that's, that's the... Uh, the story, the, now the question for you is, if you have a specific task, you have a certain theta to approximate, how will you choose the architecture? How will you choose the loss function? You want to choose it so that the true minimum is really close to what you want to, the, 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 the minimum you find after optimization is close to what you have. But you want, the important thing is you want this to function quickly. Right? And that's still a very open problem. Nobody really knows, I give you an architecture would it be fast or not? You know, except when it's close to something you know. But the real problem of building from first principles, killing the field of machine learning, that is understanding it, is still open, of course. And I hope for not too long. We're not that far from understanding things. Once we understand it, it would become as boring as basic statistics. Right? So my goal is to make it boring. Of course, this is way too ambitious. This is a really hard problem. So probably I'm too old to see the end of it, but you know, maybe you can. So, all right, so I didn't say, so I, you know, I have, okay, I still have plenty of time, okay. So that's the basic story, and I will give you a few examples. But before that, I need to do some, um, I, I, I want to explain a few things about random matrices. So before I do that, before I explain things about random matrices, yes? That's your model work with non-parametric estimation and the second... No, no. I mean, of course you could, indeed, because but what you're doing here, the, the, proce the procedure is, of course, parametric. But you choose the dimension of the parameter. You choose the, you're choosing the, the, the space of the thetas here, right? And it, it's perfectly possible that your thing is not, the, the, the true distribution is not in the space given by this. In fact, it will not be in general, but that the distance is not too large, right? That's always what you do in non-parametric. And I saw some models using, uh, like they minimize entropy directly or something like this. There, I'll come to that. There is a way to include disorder, but I, I, for the moment I won't do that. Okay? For the moment this is very simple. You have a space of, let's take it like an analyst. You have a space of functions which are defined by these crazy iterations, very different from Fourier series or wavelets. And you're saying, I'm trying to find the best, and you, find a, you define a topology, a norm, L2, LP, whatever, and I want to find the best possible approximation of the thing which I, I am observing. So, by the way, what is typically this type of thing used for? And I come back to that. The main task I'm, I have in mind this, you know, this is, I'm talking about machine learning 10 years ago. Things are now, this is kind of understood. So, the, ba the basic task is classification. Let me explain what classification is in K classes. So, basic ta the basic problem in, let's say, classification. 
So the simplest theory, so let's say you have k classes of things. Right, so for instance, I give you a gazillion pictures and you want to say two classes. There's a cat in it or there is no cat in it. Right? Or more interestingly, uh, you know, I have k classes depending on whatever characteristics of people that you want to classify. So typically, the um, one very simple way to do that is to say, I take a, a mixture of Gaussian. That's this kind of academic way to say that. So your distribution P theta is a mixture of K Gaussians, right? Which means sum of, let's say, AI So the k classes are centered at, let's say, m1, mk. That's, uh, that's the centers. And maybe some covariance matrices, depending on height. OK, so that's typically, so your parameter is here, a, m, and sigma. All right. But these are just coefficients so that the AIs are non-negative. That's a mixture. For instance, make two mixtures of two, you may have one third in one class, two thirds in the other class. So you want to learn typically the centers of the classes. And these MIs are vectors in, how did I call it? N. Right? So you have K, let's say K is 17. You have 17 vectors in Rn, N very large. These are the centers of your classes. Let's imagine that these things are, just to simplify, that these things are just the same. All the variances are the same. Identity, right? Let's say maybe with a small sigma. So you have a Gaussian bump here, a Gaussian bump here, a Gaussian bump here. That's your mixture. And you want, that's what you want to learn. You want to learn that there, you don't know that there are k classes. You want to learn that there are k classes. And you want to learn where the centers are, right? That's classification. Basic task. If I do that. I would I take all your pictures and I would classify you into whatever parameters may dis differentiate you. Okay? So that's a typical typical thing. How do you what kind of network would you build for that? For that, of course, you could do maximum likelihood if you're a classical statistician. Or you could try to build a network like that. Right? With many layers. Okay? And of course, the incredible success 10 years ago, the, when the second winter ended of machine learning, is that this type of task became doable, even with very large. So what were the XIs in this serious example? They were just pictures. Right? So in a certain number of pixels, with, and, and you have plenty of pictures, and you wanted to classify them. And there you have two different type of tasks. So let me explain, and that will be important too. You can have supervised classification and unsupervised classification. So what was doable easily 10 years ago, and of course it's still doable, is supervised classification. So what do you do? You take a bunch of those pictures, and then you ask experts, here meaning human beings, to look at them and say, yes, no, yes. Let's say if you have two classes, Class one, class two, class one, class two. Yeah. There is a cat, there is no cat, there is a cat, there is no cat in the picture. Okay? And you do that, and then from there, from there, so there you have an, your M here will be the number of images that have been classified by an expert. Right? And then you take, you take a new sample and you check. That's, uh, that's the classified, the supervised setting. The unsupervised setting is you do that without the expert, right? You don't have the expert, much harder. I don't even tell you how you do that, okay? So we'll come back to this uh, type of classification thing with when you do classification with multilayer. And everything, even though it doesn't look like it, is a question of random matrices, okay? So where is the random matrix in this story? The data is not, uh, um, 
okay, it's a random matrix, but okay, let me put it differently. It's about the spectrum of a, random, a real spectrum of, of something, of a random matrix. So, hmm? is it a correlation matrix? Maybe that's of course a very good idea. If you do, so let's go back to statistics 101. When, when you began learning statistics, or when you began, most friends I have in math know that just because they taught it, but never learned it. So, so what is the first thing you do in statistics? The statistics for, for real babies. I gave you a hint. I said there's a matrix in it, a spectrum of a matrix. Come on, that's not. What? So let me give you a hint. It goes back to 1901. Right, so it's not exactly brand new. Pearson. Okay, so none of you studied statistics. <laughs> Zero. <laughs> yes, one did, I'm sure. <laughs> She knows, but she just uh, doesn't say. So that's principal component analysis, right? So that's what Pearson said, of course. It's, so what is principal component analysis? You have this, you do nothing. You just look at the data. You have x1, xm, vectors in Rn, iid, right? according to a certain distribution. And so this gives you a cloud of m points in Rn. Of course, when Pearson was doing it, n was two or three, right? So let's say in R3, you have this cloud of points. And he said, OK, the distribution of that, I have no idea. But let me approximate geometrically, because of course, that was the heyday of mechanics, by what somebody in mechanics would do, approximate it by an ellipsoid, right? So. Let me approximate the cloud by an ellipsoid, which means simply compute the eigenvalues of the covariance matrix. That's it, or the eigenvectors. So here you construct the matrix X, X star, right? So here, if this X are columns of size n, this is an n by n matrix, right? Symmetric. Call it, I don't know, sigma n. Of course, this is supposed to approximate the true covariance matrix of, of, of uh, x. Maybe you center it. Let me, OK, maybe you could center the, let, let's assume that I've centered the x's by there. OK, I could write this. This is what, in fact, it did. Let me call x prime to be xi minus the mean. The m particle mean being 1 over n, sum of the xi. So we all know that under reasonable circumstances, this is close to the true mean. So I center them. And then I look at x prime, x prime star, and I normalize. Right? So this thing is, of course, a random matrix. It's random because the data is random. Real symmetric, size n by n, right? When m goes to infinity, when the size of the sample goes to infinity, this, ran, this matrix converges to the true covariance matrix, of course, right? So what Pearson said was, look at the spectrum of this thing. That's principal component analysis. And so you look at the spectrum of this thing. Let's call it lambda 1. My convention will always be that. Spectrum is, of course, real. Lambda 1 will be the largest one, lambda n the smallest one. So this spectrum is a random thing. And then you also have the eigenvectors E1, En, which, of course, are ortho ortho orthonormal here. Right? So what? Pearson was saying was, if my n is, uh, I don't know, 8, and I have these eigenvalues here, which of course measure the dispersion of, on your ellipsoid, the size of each axis, 
if the first two are much bigger, let's say, than all the other ones, then essentially I can describe and then in fact classify my, my distribution by just taking the projection on these first two eigenvectors on this plane. That's, ten, that's PCA. All right? So PCA works, gives you something interesting, if you have a few eigenvalues that are bigger than the others. Right? If all the eigenvalues are the same, your thing is completely spherical, then too bad. There is, you have to keep your eight-dimensional data. If you have two axes which are much bigger than the others, then you project on these two axes and you get some kind of reduction in dimension, which hopefully doesn't lose too much from your original description. That's PCA. Okay? End of statistics 101. Good. So now, what about PCA if n is very large? Right? So what about PCA in the modern setting where n is 10 to the 9? What? You don't know. You can't condition on something you don't know at all and you don't observe. So, what do we know about that? Okay, that's where random matrix theory comes in. Okay? Because of course now, this object is a random matrix of high dimension. So we are asking questions about the spectrum and the eigenvectors of the spectrum of a random, a large random matrix. That's what random matrix theory is for. Okay? So that's one example where you, you could feel that maybe there is a link. Because here, what is that saying? This is saying, imagine that you have something about the spectrum of this random matrix in high dimension. And imagine that you have something like what Pearson was looking at. That is that you have 17 eigenvalues which are much bigger than the other a billion minus 17 eigenvalues then probably you should say there is a signal in those things and maybe those directions are interesting right that's what we will end up this whole class with dimension reduction. yes sorry uh, what was the significance of large n in the context of pca again here up to here n is fixed n is eight but now i want to go back to the context i had before the dimension of my vectors is large that's what we're doing Okay, so suddenly your matrix here is indeed a large matrix. Here it was an 8 by 8 matrix. Now it's a billion by a billion matrix. Right, but we're still doing just PCA as yes. we would do usually. Yes, but now the question is, can you, of course what I'm saying here is just uh, abstract. You have obvious results in finite dimension, I will come back to that, saying that if you have a signal, if indeed you have your distribution depends mainly of two directions, you will find it in the correlation structure. Whereas now the question is, if I have a signal in dimension, a signal of size 17, of dimension 17, you will realize 17 is an important number for me, but 17, 17 just means finite, and I don't want to say one or two. Okay, so if you have something of, some, of dimension 17, but in a, in a matrix of dimension a billion? Are you sure that the signal will come out? Why not? The answer is no, it doesn't. Not all the time. That's the fun part about this. High, high dimension is difficult. And I will give you, and the name of when it happens that this thing comes out or not, where you can observe it or not, is called the BBP transition. That's what I'm aiming at. Okay? Can you, can you Signals, yes, it's called the BBP threshold. <laughs> That's cool, you're understanding where I'm going. So, so now, so that's this. Uh, here I just gave you one possible instance of occurrence of a random matrix in this kind of very simple statistics. Of course, in the things we'll be doing, it may be more complicated. But let's, that was uh, 1901. I'm saying there is another very natural, another random matrix somewhere in this statistics problem. 
maybe the the initialized weights of the neural networks? Yeah, but that's yeah. Again, you you always forget the idea of having it with a real spectrum. Nobody wants to work with a complex spectrum, right? Why? Because complex spectrum is not stable at all. Real spectrum is infinitely more stable. So you have many more chances to lose your signal if you look at complex things. Okay, so where do we have, so when I say random matrix here, I, means, I mean Hermitian or real symmetric matrix. Where do you have a real symmetric matrix in this story? What? Deviation. Yeah, but you're an expert. <laughs> Yes, of course, we have a random function, right? Our random function, remember? L hat. That's the one we want to minimize. It's a random function. If you take at any point the Hessian of this thing, for any theta, this is a random matrix. Right? This is a real symmetric random matrix of size n by n, right? So that's a natural random matrix associated with the problem. Okay, we will see that both this thing play an important role. Okay, so what is the use? So let me give you a preview. What is the use of the understanding the Hessian? So now, of course, I'm saying the Hessian, but at what point? Where did you compute it? Exactly like for this, I didn't tell you where you compute it. So you could take theta to be a random point in your configuration space, right? Then the computation of this, the distribution of this Hessian, we'll see, is important to understand the topology because of a formula, with what is called the Katz-Rice formula. So if you want to understand the topological complexity of your system, this is the important random matrix. So remember when we described the two things that could be hard in high dimension, one was this topological complexity, the fact that you may have many wells and, uh, and you know, sticking region for your algorithm. The way to understand it is through this random matrix. If you want to understand what is important dynamically, this one is the important one. So that's for the statics, that's for the dynamics. Okay, we'll see that. Okay, so, but before, so that was just to whet your appetite, but now let's go back to the basic things on random matrices. Of course, I cannot give you a full class on random matrix in, uh, or maybe I stop here for two minutes if you want just to breathe and then we continue. Okay, so I'll, I'll uh, let's say, I don't know, do, 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 do we need a, a, a break? No? Let's go on then. So it's a little, a little uh, unseemly to say, just let me give you random matrix in one blackboard. But, uh, okay, so, so where should I, uh, should I assume zero or just a bit or what? Thierry, you're the boss. Okay, so let's start with zero. All right, so, so there are essentially two, very widely speaking, two big classes of random matrices, okay, and which give interesting things about their spectrum. And, and both of them will be important here. One class will be important for this one, the other class will be important for that one, okay? So, how did random matrix emerge? That's, of course, the wrong answer. <laughs> yeah, so in physics it emerged in 50-something with Wigner, and it emerged in the wrong corner of physics, which was quantum. Because, in fact, it had emerged before, almost 30 years before, in statistics for that, 
right? That's the Wishart did that. So, so the first one to really emerge the random. So random matrix means looking at the spectrum of random matrices when the size is large, right? That's a, so the first example is Wishart. The second is Wigner. Okay, so the first is the, the two important things in, in life is statistics and physics. Okay, so the the um, so let me explain first Wigner because that's easier to explain. So this case. Wigner matrices. Of course, now we I mean, many more random matrices have been studied, but let me start with a basic example. So here you take a random matrix, let's say M, of size N. Let's say, I mean, you could take it real symmetric or or um, Hermitian. I will not dwell too much on the complex case because here we will be essentially on the real case, but the complex case is a little simpler. And, and you take it random by saying that the Mij's are Iid. In fact, there will be a slight modification later, but let me forget that. So the simplest situation is just you just take the elements of your random matrix to be Iid. Okay. And of course, under the symmetry constraint, right? Mij are Iid for i larger than j, and then you take the, the symmetry. And you, so this has a real spectrum, as before. And you ask yourself, what can I say about the spectrum? So you have very many different questions about the spectrum. The first question, of course, is the simplest one, the only one that Wigner really solved, which is the global question, bulk. So, you know, you have a history. These are random variables, these lambda i's. They're obviously very correlated, They're certainly not iid. You have n square or n square over two iid random variables, and these ones are a projection of n variable, which are the projection of these n square. They are very correlated, as we'll see. And the question is, you know, you draw your histogram. What does it look like? Okay. So, how do you draw? A way to say I draw the histogram is I look at. So first, I so I look at let's say the empirical measure, which is just. You put a Dirac mass at which each of these eigenvalues. So that's a random measure on the real line. As is, it cannot converge to anything. Why? Because if you compute the second moment of this, so I'm just explaining the normalization that is needed here. So of course this. Which is of course one over n trace of m. How do I call it? M square, right? Which is of course one over n sum of m i n. Let's say i j square, right? So what is the order of magnitude of this? Let's assume that. So here we assume that the the expect the, the each the entries have a second moment. Otherwise, it's a different story, right? So what is the order of magnitude of that? A constant, right? That's the if you take the expectation of that, this is a constant. This is a variance. You have n square terms divided by n, so this is of order n. So it cannot converge. Right? So you have to normalize the eigenvalue by square root n. And if you do that, you have an n square here, and everybody's happy. Okay, this, this, this is a finite number, asymptotically. So you look at this thing, and the result, the theorem, is that this converges to something when n is large. It converges weakly to the semicircle distribution. Right? So the spectrum looks like a semicircle.
And the semicircle, so that's what that is. The radius here depends, of course, on the variance. We call it sigma square. OK? So the semicircle is essentially square root of r squared minus x squared dx normalized properly. This z is just the area of the semicircle, which everybody can compute. OK? So that's a very, I mean, it's not a hard result. In fact, a very simple one. But um, which the important thing in the way I stated it here is that it's already universal. Right? Understand that the, the distribution of the entries play no role. The limiting result is this. So what other theorem do you know that is universal? You take a sum of things, a random objects, and then the, the limiting thing is always the same. Funk. Yeah, I taught you that. <laughs> of course, the central limit theorem. <laughs> Too long ago, yeah. <laughs> of course, the central limit theorem. And we have the same kind of assumption here. In fact, this is a central limit theorem in what is called free probability, non-commutative probability. Right? So in free probability, this is the additive central limit theorem, if you want. And that's why this is universal. OK? Good. So that's the bulk. What, what other questions could you ask? Of course, you could stay on this and ask what about fluctuations around this right that is what is the size of between the, some distance between mu n and the semicircle right that's an interesting result i won't go there you could ask for large deviations What is the probability that mu n is, let's say, close to a measure nu, when nu is not the semicircle? Right? So this should be small. Right? How small? Large deviation would be something like this. Because the rate should be n squared, right? Obviously. Because in fact, the spectrum is a function of n square iid random variable. So it should be n square. OK, so is that possible? Is that proved? So this is still a very open question. OK, so this was done in 97, so not exactly yesterday, for the case where, in the Gaussian case. The Gaussian case, that is when you take all the mij's to be Gaussian, distributed as, let's say, n0, 1. This is called the GOE. Something I will continue. This means the Gaussian orthogonal ensemble. So in this case, this has been done. Why is it possible in the Gaussian case? Because in the Gaussian case, you can write explicitly the distribution of the eigenvalues. And then you can work. So that's quite easy. That was done by Alice Guillonet. and myself a long time ago. But since then, so that's the Gaussian case. You know, for I, some of IID, you, you have the central limit theorem, the law of large number, but you have a large deviation in a very large class. Doing this for a larger class is incredibly difficult. Right? So for 27 years, it has moved only recent progress by at, at a completely different level of mathematics, by Alice, of course, as always, and, uh, and others. Uh, uh, Dusson, I'm, I'm probably forgetting people, Giulio, Biroli, and others. But only in very specific classes. Right? So for the moment, if you want a really hard problem, push on this one. Now, what else could we do so that you can go further in this thing? The other thing you could do is try to go a little more local. Here, the scale we're looking at is global. 
We are looking at all the eigenvalues, right? If I take mu n of an interval, I'm counting how many intervals I have in, how many eigenvalues I have in this interval, which will be like n. You could look now at, at sc spatial scales which are smaller than n, than that. So what is the typical distance between two eigenvalues? Of course, it's one over n, right? Because you have, once, it, once they are normalized by square root n, right? You have n of them in a finite interval, this thing. So globally, you have, the distance between them is one over n. So the local behavior scale one over n, this is much harder. So this was done, this was understood, of course, in the case of GOE a long time ago. This is pure uh, integrable system type things. But for uh, the universality for that has been the big thing that has happened now 10, 15 years ago. And it's continued, so that's uh, uh, HD Yao, uh, Lan Vu, uh, Tao. And now this is continued by Laszlo Erdős. Not the old Erdős, of course. So, and the result of that, I, I won't go there because I won't need that, is that essentially when you take your the, a general class of IID random variables, the local behavior of this point process is the same as for the Gaussian case. And we have very precise description. In particular, you have this description of the phenomenon, which is called repulsion of eigenvalues. These eigenvalues, you have this, they are like a repulsion case of a point system. Right? You have, these particles don't want to be too close. Right? So you can study the smallest gap, the largest gap, all that has been done. And uh, particularly in the joint work with Paul Bogard. And, uh, so this universal local behavior is kind of well understood. All right, but I won't, I won't go there. Because remember what we need? We need the largest eigenvalues, or the smallest ones. Right? We need the edge. So since, so what about the edge? So uh, can you repeat uh, what you call the universal here in terms of the law of the random variables? You take this context, IID, let's say for the, the simplest case, IID random variable, Wigner matrices, the, the behavior of the point process at scale 1 over n is the same as in the Gaussian case. I don't tell you what it is, but so for instance, if you look at the distribution of a typical spacing, it's the same whether it's Gaussian or not Gaussian. But so you're not making uh, other assumptions? No, just second moment finding. Okay, so that's a very, okay, that's in the bulk. Now about the edge. So what is the edge? Let's consider the, the right edge here, which is lambda 1, right? That's the top eigenvalue, for instance. I can, I can do more, but let's do that. So the result that I have here does not prevent you from having lambda 1 very far from the bulk. It has to be on the right. But of course, if, even if it were far away, you wouldn't see it here, right? Because remember, where is mu n? Mu n is here. So if one point, if you have a million points and one point decides to go astray on the right, it won't change the, the bulk, right? So this result doesn't tell you anything about the top eigenvalue, except that the top eigenvalue must be on the right of R, right? It cannot be here, of course, okay? So that, but you don't know where it is. So first, it's true that in this context, so here you expect you need a little more assumption you need the force moment to be finite. I don't believe that's just a weakness. If you take less than four moments, there are works by Alice Guillaume and myself to prove that the behavior of the top eigenvalues is not that. But if you have this, then the top eigenvalue converges to the edge. Okay? Which is interesting. And you also have the fluctuations. So the top eigenvalue minus the edge <coughs> converges normalized by n to the two-third converges in distribution to something 
which is called the Tracy Widom distribution. The real Tracy Widom distribution for the GOE. Right? So I don't tell you how you compute that. It's, it's full of uh, Hermit polynomials, every function and all that, but let's forget that. It's a new universal, like the Gaussian distribution, like the semicircle. And it tells you that the, the fluctuation here is of size n to the minus two third, right? Which is a new exponent for when you come from the word of the Gaussian setting, right? And this, this is a, a new distribution. Okay, so that's the important thing. You could ask this out of the fluctuation. You could ask, and we will need that, what about large deviation principle? So you have a large deviation principle for the top eigenvalue. Of course, you also have a result for the second eigenvalue and so on. I'll just skip that. So what is the probability that the top eigenvalue minus r is larger now than a constant? Right? So what is the probability that the top eigenvalue is here? How does that behave? What is the probability that the top eigenvalue, what, so that's large deviation on the right, what is the large deviation on the, on the left? What is the probability that the top eigenvalue is here? So this you should know. What is the order of magnitude? I'm sorry? Yes. This gives you the answer. Because you're asking the top eigenvalue to be here, which means you're asking the bulk to charge this set only, which is an atypical set. So you would get exponential minus n square, and you can compute it some constant, depending on a, of course. Right? So it's very improbable that you can push the, the top eigenvalue inside the bulk. What is the probability of this? This is now minus n of a to some another constant of a. Right? So it's much easier for the top eigenvalue to move right, of course, than to move left. And all this is explicit. This is done in a work on spin glasses dynamics by Amir Dembo. It's also very, very old. Alice Guillonet and myself. This go back to 99, I think, or 2000 or something. Okay, so the, the, the large deviation, it's important to understand that the top eigenvalue sticks to the bulk and, of course, can move to the right, but at a price which is exponentially small. Okay, good. So that's for the Wigner case. Let me stick with the Wigner case for the moment. Oops. Or rather, let me go. No, let me let me before I go to uh, more advanced stuff. Let me stay with that. Let me now take the the Wishart case. That's the second class of examples. So now again, you take x one x m. I a d random variable in Rn, right? So these are vectors of size n, and you have m of them. And you look at the matrix as we did before, x, x transposed, OK? So that's an n by n matrix. I normalize it by 1 over n, call this mn. OK, let me assume these guys to be centered and with a fourth moment. Let's say so now I have a real symmetric matrix as we had before so I can look at the spectrum okay if I have n fix and m go to infinity this will of course converge to the uh, covariance matrix of each of these guys here, I'm taking the limit. The important thing is that m is a constant times n. Okay. Uh, 
In this context, the spectrum, so the spectrum of these guys Then I can look again at the, uh, the empirical measure, which is a random measure on R. Now on R plus, because of course this is a symmetric matrix, but also positive, right? So the eigenvalues are positive. This converges, what a surprise, to a certain distribution. Uh, let me call it like this. Marchenko-Pasteur index alpha. So Wishart did that, I mean understood that, didn't really write that in the 30s, when the excise were Gaussian. Marchenko-Pasteur did that in the 60s and 70s in Ukraine when the excise were whatever. And this Marchenko-Pasteur distribution is explicit. And it has something, so it has a shape. So of course it depends, everything, it depends whether this alpha is less or less than one or larger than one, because of course in one case you would have the, the, the rank of this will not be sufficient, so you will have the zero eigenvalues or not. Let me be the case where it not, doesn't happen. It has a shape like this between a certain A and a certain B that I can give you explicitly. Okay, if you want the real formula, I can give it to you. Maybe you don't. So you have the same thing. And everything else, so that's the bulk. And every, everything I've written So what I wrote over there, so I had the bulk and then I had the fluctuations. Large deviation in the case in the Gaussian case. Well, that is true. Now, the edge and the universality too. The edge, same thing. The top eigenvalue, lambda 1, converges to the edge of the bulk, which I called here B. Right? And by the way, the, the lowest eigenvalue, I didn't say that for the other, of course, everything would have been the same for the smallest eigenvalue, right? Same thing here. Uh, edge of the bulk, which is A here. Okay, so the, the top eigenvalue sticks to the bulk. And you have also the, the same Tracy Widom fluctuation. This fluctuation of the edge, which I didn't describe, here is also universal. Yes? Yeah, for the, I'm sorry, for the fourth moment condition, it's component wise or is it for the vector? Because component-wise, it seems that it should be, it could be like a specific case of the linear. No, it's not at all. The, the entries of x, x star are not independent. Even if the entries are x. You could, you could choose the, the coordinates to be independent from each other. If you choose the, the xi's to be independent, the entries of m's are not independent. The entries of M are sum of X i k, X k j. Right? So in general, they will not be independent. So the entries are not independent. Okay? So this result here, I could have said this is the Gaussian theorem for matrices, right? Because it's also universal. And in fact, it is. This is for free convolution, for random matrices. For in the non-commutative word, you have in fact two notions of convolution, of addition. This one is called the free addition, this one is called the free multiplication, for whatever reason. And these are the two central limit theorem corresponding to, to these two things. And by the way, if you like this story, which is, you also have the non-Gaussian things. You would have also the stable processes and all this type of thing if your, if your entries have heavier tails. But let's not go there, even though a lot of papers today about machine learning say that the entries have heavy tails. But I'll stay on the simple thing. Okay, so the story is the same. You have the same size of fluctuations, the same large deviation, the same story, except that the bulk is different. Okay? 
Good. So all that is random matrices. Okay, either... So again, the first case, the Wigner case, will correspond to my Hessian. Right? The Hessian will be a real symmetric matrix. Of course, the entries have no reason to be independent. Right? So the first question you, you may want to ask, and of course this has been asked a million times, is this is described in the case where the MIGs are AID. How much of it survives if you have more complicated structures? Right? Same thing for that. Vast literature, I don't have time. Okay, but this one will be important for the, the other thing I was describing. This, of course, you see, this, this looks like PCA. All right, so now all that is good, but there's no signal here. Okay? So, there's, so let's put the signal, because we want to do machine learning when we want to learn when there is something to learn. If there is nothing to learn, then it's purely random. It's cool, but uh, so here is the the idea of adding a finite dimensional signal. So what can that be in the world of random matrices? You have a random matrix, whether it's class one or class two, Wigner or Wisher, and you add a finite rank matrix, right? For, for Wigner. So finite rank perturbations. What are the natural things? And that's crucial. Without the finite rank perturbation, you have no signal, so the statistics you're looking at is empty. So first thing, let's, let's take the Wigner case. Okay, so I take my random matrix, M, which is still over there, entries IID. So M is a Wigner matrix with the assumptions that are over there. Let me assume that all the entries are centered, do not forget. Okay. Yeah, I didn't say that here, of course. Let me assume that to simplify things. It does, it's not crucial, but it's for this, but for that it will be. So let me assume that the, the entries are centered. The second moment is finite. In fact, I will need more assumption and moments, but because this will be more delicate. But now I look at the matrix MN plus AN, okay, where this AN is finite rank. So R is 17, AM has a rank, MN has a diverging size, and you want to understand the spectrum of that, okay? So if you want to think, Imagine AN is just the matrix with rank 1, where you have a 1, just in order to visualize this, just take AN to be 1 here and all zeros, right? Maybe with a constant C here. Okay, so the simplest thing. You're just modifying one entry. What does it do on the spectrum? So that's what we were discussing a minute ago with you, right? So here, the bulk doesn't change. Okay, so if you take one over what I call nu n, I think. So if you do a perturbation of rank 17 in a matrix whose size goes to a gazillion, the bulk, you see nothing. Okay? 
and okay, I won't go into what's up in, in, in the inner bulk, of course, nothing changes. But now, what about the edge? So what was proposed here 10 minutes ago was the edge, of course, will move. Right? And the answer is no, the edge doesn't always move. Right? There is a transition. That's the so-called BBP transition. So let me say it in words, then I will give you too many formulae, which says the following. If, let me imagine, just to simplify that, an is rank one, so that I can discuss, discuss one eigenvalue. Because if you want to discuss all at the same time, it becomes more complicated. Right, so if you have one eigen, so let's say when C, let's say an is just this, Of course, it's valid in, gener in full generality, but just to simplify. Okay, so if n is rank 1, you may imagine that it could change the one eigenvalue. But that depends on c, of course. So you could think if my c, if you want, the, the eigenvalue I'm adding to the spectrum is somewhere in the middle, it shouldn't change much. Right? So that seems natural that there is a threshold so that when c is less than c star, the top eigenvalue converges to the edge of the bulk. Right? So if you do a rank one perturbation which is too small, then you don't see this signal. This signal is lost. That's what it means. If this is a signal for you, you had noise and you have added a signal, the sig this, when the signal, even though it's positive, so it, in here it normalized by square root n, it can be large, it's completely lost. You cannot see it there. Maybe you can think, maybe I can see it inside the bulk or something delicate. Now, when c is larger than c star, you expect that lambda one converges to something, the function of c, which is strictly larger than the edge of the bulk. Right, so it will converge to something here. Right, so it emerges from the bulk. Okay. This threshold is explicit that the BBP threshold, and it's not what you think. There is a regime where, in fact, the top I, the, this, this added signal is, in fact, the, the eigenvalue of this. If you want, the threshold is not, if you just take an, what is its eigenvalue? It has only one, which is c, right? Every, everybody else is zero. So you could think that when c is less than this r, then it stays in. When c is larger than r, it goes out wrong. There was a regime where c is larger than r and still the eigenvalue stays in. That's bad news for statistics, if you see that. Because it tells you, you could have a strong signal, right, and still it doesn't show, okay? So the BBP transition is much more elaborate than that. This is, it tells you things, and I will come back to that maybe next time. It tells you more than that. So first, when you are below the BBP threshold, the fluctuation of the top eigenvalue remain tracy widom right? So even, so even at the level of fluctuations, you see nothing there. So, so here I gave you the law of large number if you want, but you have fluctuations. So if your C is less than this critical value, of course this critical value depends on, oh here, no I didn't put anything else, no that's, when C is less than this critical value, the fluctuation of the top eigenvalue minus the edge times n to the two-third goes to Tracy Widom. 
right? So not only the top eigenvalue, the, the edge of the spectrum is the same, but its fluctuations are the same. So you cannot see it, right? If C is strictly, of course, the interesting case is, of course, like, since mathematicians are perverts, what we like is C equals C star, right? <laughs> but I won't, I won't describe that. So when C is larger than C star, this thing fluctuates, guess what, Gaussianly. When you have something outside of the spectrum on its own, if you have only one, it fluctuates Gaussian. Things can be much so, in, when C is close to C star, I won't tell you how much, right, asymptotically close to C star, then the fluctuation is still two-third, and it converts to what we call modified area, modified tracy with a new thing. And there is a, a, a delicate transition here that I won't describe. But now if you look at the large deviation principle, then the large deviation principle feels the, 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 the rank one perturbation. Let, let me not say more than that. So this is a result by Milan Maida, which is also very old now, like 18 years old. So if you have this rank one, let's say, perturbation, then the large deviation principle feels it. Okay. The, uh, of course, this is with one. Now if you have two, what happens? So it's more, more complicated. Of course, again, you could have, or if you have 17, then you could create out of these 17, you could have 12 that are out and 15 that are in. If you understand what out and in means. Five could stay in inside the bulk and 12 could go out. I mean, the whole story can be described. If you have, it's a long story, but if you have, let's say only two, and the two of them are equal, then when they come out, then they don't fluctuate Gaussianly. How do they fluctuate? Somebody can guess. You add a rank two thing, which is a multiple of the identity, right? Just you have, instead of having C, Sarah, you have C, C. What happens, of course, is that this rank two thing becomes, when you are in this regime where it's out of the spectrum, becomes autonomous. And so the it's become a random matrix of size two. So the top eigenvalue fluctuates like the top eigenvalue of a random matrix of size two, which is not Gaussian. So why did I get Gaussian here? Because the top eigenvalue of a random matrix of size one is of course is of course Gaussian, right? That's it. Okay, so that's that's the BBB transition. This has been done. So in the B, the BBB case was the first paper, which is long ago, was not done in the Wigner case. Was done in the Wishart case. But even in the Wigner case, it has been done initially in the Gaussian context, and then along many years, it has been extended to a general universal context under the proper assumptions, right? And with the fluctuation, with the, you know, there are some, this paper is like a, a workhorse of statistics. So you have uh, more than a thousand people working on this thing. So it's a, a long story. I will just keep the minimum here. All right, so that was for Wigner, and I have five minutes to tend to do the same thing for Wishart. So, so in general, yes. how explicit is the C star? I mean, you, you it's completely explicit. I can give it to you. It, it's just a very simple algebraic function of what I called. Gosh, where is it? Alpha, the ratio of m and n. Mm -hmm. Right. That's all. It's like one of one plus one over square root of alpha or something like this. It's a very simple thing. So. In the regime C less than C star, you, you said something briefly, but didn't give details. Do you still have a way to fill uh, in the limit the pollution by the AN? Is there? No. You can't measure anything. No. That's, for instance, one of the reasons, you know, I mentioned initially these three things, information theory, statistics, algorithmics. 
uh, if we could do that, we would kill the information theory part of all this. Right? So in fact, no. It's drawn. It's just drawn in the sea, and you can see it. I mean, if you can, tell me. That's, that would be, I would love it. So now, uh, going back to this. So that's the Wishart case. So over there, I had the Wigner case. A natural modification of it was to add something of finite rank. How would you change here the structure of this thing? Adding something is not reasonable because it, you don't stay in the family of covariance matrices. How would you change this with a finite rank perturbation? Yes? By what? Uh, rank one, uh, rank yeah. one matrix. Multiply by a rank one matrix, it, the spectrum would not be too complicated, right? You do you you learn statistics one on one, and you take the render, the covariance matrix of a more general thing. What is the covariance matrix? Here I assume formally that the covariance matrix was like identity. Now now let's do this. Right? You put let's say a diagonal matrix in the middle here. And this diagonal matrix, so in this context, the, the original context is diagonal, D is identity. Now I just take D is identity plus finite rank. So it would be something like diagonal of uh, D1, D2, D17, and then 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1. Right? So here I have a finite rank perturbation of my story here. That's the original BVP, okay? So results, same, not the one I just described. That is, there is a value under which, so let's, let me assume that I've ordered them. Of course I could, by the way, here, in this context, I could look at perturbation on the right or on the left, and it's not the same. In the semicircle case, it was the same thing. Here, I could look at top eigenvalues, I mean, large eigenvalues, large modes, or small modes, right? But let me concentrate on large modes, because when you do PCA, that's what you look at. What? No, 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 identity. Because if everybody is identity, I'm back to the thing I had before, okay? So the results are the same. So you have your spectrum, which does this without a perturbation. You have the edge here. And now when you're, let's, let's assume that I have only one to simplify, only D1. When D1 is larger than a certain threshold, then you will have the top eigenvalue outside of the bulk. When it's below the certain threshold, the top eigenvalue is inside. I mean, is, is, is R, rather. And you have the same result. The fluctuations are tracy widom or this kind of modified tracy widom or Gaussian, depending in which regime you are. Exactly these three things. Okay, same story. And same thing, if you have now 17 of them coming out, you could have all sorts of interesting complications where you can, you lose maybe five dimensions out of 17 and you keep 12. Right? All that is possible. And by the way, of course, I didn't say anything here, and I will close with that, about the eigenvectors. When you are in the regime where you can't see, when you lose the signal, here, the top eigenvalue is just the edge, and the top eigenvector is essentially a vector chosen at random. When you take a random matrix, essentially, let's take, let's take to understand that, take the case where it's Gaussian. When it's Gaussian, the distribution of your matrix is isotropic. It's uh, invariant under rotation. So obviously, your eigenbasis is just a random element of the Stiefel manifold, right? So your top eigenvector is just a vector at random on the sphere. When you put a signal in this regime, you lose it. The top eigenvector is still at random. But when you are above the signal, then you may begin to think here that the top eigenvector may begin to feel the first coordinate a little more. So if in this regime now you let C become very large, you can prove that the top eigenvector aligns with the signal, with this one. Right? Same thing over there. 
That's the only important result for statistics. Nobody cares about the eigenvalues. Everybody cares about the eigenvectors. Remember, when you do PCA, what you're looking at are, of course, the, the, the important axes. And the axes are the eigenvectors. Right? So if you are deep in the regime of the BBP transition, when the, BB, the transition is really marked, and your top eigenvalue here, of course, when you increase the C, or here the D1, your top eigenvalue will become very large compared to the bulk. Then when it's very separated, you can naturally imagine that the top eigenvector aligns with the, top, with the eigenvector of the perturbation. And this is what happens. This will be the core thing that we will need for, for data analysis. OK, and I stop here. Are there any questions on uh, this uh, first session? Maybe just a sweet question, but I'm wondering if there is a, like you say that um, the Wishar semi or Wigner semicircle is basically like the central limit theorem for, for free probability. Is there like the same connection between um, like the Tracy wheel fluctuation and like the generalized uh, extreme value theorem? No. Okay. <laughs> the free extreme value theory exists. It has been done by guess who? Alice Guillonet and myself. <laughs> so you can look at it. And, um, oh, maybe I'm joking here. Maybe it's not Alice. I forgot. Anyway, it's done. And the distribution we find are not this. Because you see here, the distribution of the, of the top eigenvalue, let's say you have only rank one, right? So the distribution of this top guy is, is Gaussian. Now, you, the question you ask could be about the, the extreme without a signal, right? You just have a sum of IID, right? And so, what is the, this Tracy Widom? This is not, in fact, something that, that uh, would be the natural thing for the extreme eigenvalue, or for the, the I, extreme value theory for free probability theory. We, we classify them. It's not a hard problem, in fact. That's not difficult, and, but it's not that. Uh, quick, quick question on the, um, as you as you mentioned, when when you pull the C yeah. and far enough, okay, yeah. you to point that in the direction, and um, uh, is it understood the fluctuation around that when you are going back to the bulk? Yes, so that's why. So when you're when you're as soon as you're away, it fluctuates Gaussianly. No, the, I mean of the eigenvector. Ah, the eigenvector, yes. So not completely, not not at the critical thing, because at the critical, it's it it goes from. Essentially, so again, the top eigenvector is an element of the sphere, the unit sphere. Mm -hmm. A random vector is, you know, let's say you have the, the, the true eigenvector of your signal. Let's say here the vector E1. Mm -hmm. So I put it as my north pole. Again, a random vector is on the equator, a distance 1 over root n. And you have this transition when it emerges, it emerges to a distance which is microscopic, but larger than 1 over root n. Mm -hmm. And then it becomes macro macroscopic when you have the BBP transition, and then, then it goes to, it converges to, the, to this thing, right? So that's, so, but indeed there is a microscopic uh, regime where the, the distance is too large to, uh, the distance from the equator, if you want, is too large to be random, or the distance to the North Pole is too small to be random. In my picture that I draw with these two wells, it's when you begin to fall into the well. That, no, that, that's doable. Just to understand for the next time, uh, the, what, what, is the, uh, what will be the perturbation when you want to apply it to? The signal. Yeah, but uh, I mean, if I take the X1, XM, it's, it's the data I, 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 I'm working on. If I assume that there is a... So let's say, let's say something very simple. You want a, a very simple example. Take... Here's a nice problem. I take a... a let's say... T, I, J, K, whatever. I1, I2, I, P. Right? So that's a tensor, a P tensor. Right in Rn, so that's an Rnp, whatever. That's and I take I take it to be completely random. 
right? So th let's say this guy is like Gaussian. Okay, so that's my random tensor. If you, if you don't like tensor, think p equal 1 and you have vector or matrices, p equal 2 and you have matrices. So let's say they are IAD, all IAD, let's say N0, 1 for a moment. Right? So that's a random tensor. And in fact, my unknown, my statistical problem is to find a vector theta, which is in Rn, but the way I have access to it is through a tensor product. So I, I have access to theta to the power p, right? So that's a rank one tensor, right? Perturbed by noise. So what I see is a sample of things like this. Right? So I have the signal plus random noise. Right? Let me put an I here because my coordinates were here. Right? And I have 1 to M. Okay, and then I have a certain, if you want, signal to noise ratio. So the signal to noise ratio should be here. Right? So when lambda is large, I have a lot of signal. When lambda is small, I have z when lambda is zero, I have zero signal. So that's what that's your data. You want to measure a vector. But you have access only to this, okay? And now, and let's say these guys, and now you, that's what you observe, and you do, what can you do with this? You do baby statistics, you do, machine, you, do, you do maximum likelihood. Then if you do that, you have a, your random blah, 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 and this is the thing you want to find. And depending on the values of lambda, I will describe this, you have either it's information theor theoretically and you have these three steps. It can be infeasible, even if you're the god of statistic, of information theory, rather. And then it, can be, it becomes feasible, then it could be feasible with some processes, but not with machine, maximum likelihood. And then you have the, the uh, algorithmic thing. And we will see there is a huge gap. There's a whole region where statistically it's doable, but you have to be a god of optimization that maybe you are, but that I'm not. So, so, so there's a big gap in which a priori, if you could find the, the maximum likelihood, you would have solved the problem, but in fact you cannot. Right? So that's what we'll, we'll see.